about the USA? Do you know about the government? Can you tell me about the Constitution? Hey, learn about the USA. Hello again. In this video, we are going to talk about public goods and the economic perspective on government. So as we left off in the last lecture, we talked about how the rationale for government from an economic point of view is to provide public goods. We want private goods to be produced by entrepreneurs in the market economy because the incentives are such that competitive market processes lead to low prices, large consumer surplus, and ongoing innovation with respect to new products, improved products, enhanced quality, and cost reduction. So the market process with competition and entrepreneurship, innovation, the incentives and information that prices provide works very well for the production and distribution of private goods. But with public goods, it doesn't work so well. So we want government to provide public goods. And then we talk about the economics of government. And this is what we'll, we'll move on to and we'll analyze this over the next few lectures. We frame this in terms of public choice versus private choice. So actions that are undertaken and decisions that are made in the government realm by political actors versus actions and decisions that are undertaken in the private realm by market actors, consumers, entrepreneurs, businesses, and how these differ with respect to basic incentive structures. And there are going to be some significant differences in the incentive structure governing public actions versus private actions. So as we mentioned, the economic purpose of government is to provide public goods. And we want to think about it in this way. Which of good or service here can we not acquire through the market process? So basically relying on entrepreneurs to set up profit-oriented businesses to provide these products or services for us. Clothing, well, of course, I can go down to the uh, local department store, Walmart. Um, I've got a tremendous selection. I can go online and get any kind of custom clothing, style, design, fit that I could possibly imagine. So that's handled very well by the private, competitive, profit-oriented economy. Same thing with cars. Same thing with food. So there's a long list of private goods that the market economy, entrepreneurship, profit and loss, competition provides tremendously well for us. But then we look at things like national defense, and some would be in favor of this, maybe some not so much, but if you want a strong national defense, a, a large and capable military that can project force across the world, well, that's something you're very unlikely to get from a, a, a business or even a consortium of businesses. That's something we're going to have to call on the government. And it's going to have to be a powerful and large government with a lot of resources in order to do that in a big way. And just to review, public goods have these unique attributes. They are non-excludable and non-rival. Non-excludability, you'll recall, means that it's difficult to get people to produce public goods. You can't force people to pay for them. Therefore, you can't collect income from producing them. Non-rivalry, remember, means benefits are large and the benefits spill over to additional people with no extra cost. So in the case of certain public goods, and we'll, we'll detail these momentarily, the benefits can be very large for the entire community because they're non-rival. But entrepreneurs are going to be reluctant to produce them because they can't collect income. So how do we solve that? We bring in the government Government solves non-excludability by forcing people to pay through taxation. And then government addresses the non-rivalry issue by basically offering the good to everybody in a jurisdiction on an equal basis. Essentially, the good is provided for free. And by that, I mean there's no additional charge after you've paid whatever taxes you owe. There's no additional charge, or at least minimal, to access basic public goods like national defense or highways or parks or what have you. In general, the government kind of offers a bundle of public goods on a more or less equal basis to everybody in the society. Okay, so now let's get into examples of public goods and we'll start at the national level. So national defense, as I mentioned, I like the example of the Navy here because the Navy is both a, a seaborne force and an airborne force, right? The, the Navy is kind of a air force at sea and it can project force all across the world. And it is a very visible mechanism of defending our country from aggressors who would come in either by sea or by air, go Navy public health, we have things like the Centers for Disease Control, very prominent lately with the COVID-19 pandemic and providing uh, guidelines, providing research, 
and then maybe perhaps involved with um, assessing treatments that would be effective in combating this, vaccines, that kind of thing. Certain aspects of a public health regime are public goods. Vaccination is a public good because the benefits are non-rival in the sense that they spill over to the entire community. For each person that gets vaccinated, that protects that person, but it also protects other people because it helps limit the spread of the disease. So we have public goods aspects to this. Law and order, having the police defending the community that has spillover benefits. If the police do a good job, everyone in the community benefits from that. Having a fair and functional legal system, court system. Again, if that functions well, that allows businesses to flourish. That allows for a certain level of peace and security in the community. So that benefits everybody. So we're talking about non-rival goods, goods with benefits for a large group of people. And then transportation infrastructure. So the government funds things like interstate highways, airports, and so on. Now, are interstate highways technically public goods? Well, no, they are excludable because we know that because there's a, such a thing as toll roads. And they're also non-rival as well as attested by traffic jams. But we generally treat things like public roads as public goods. I, I sometimes call them quasi-public goods. They're largely public goods. And you can think about public goods as a continuum. Remember, we talked about rivalness as a continuum. Excludability maybe is something of a continuum. There, there's an issue of how technically feasible is it to exclude non-payers. So some things are quasi-public goods, but we kind of treat them as if they were full public goods. So that's why the government pays for things like highways and airports and so on. Okay, now let's look at the local level. So we have defense at the local level. A large part of what the police force does is protects the city against uh, violence, looting, rioting, criminals out there causing harm to people. Public health at the local level. A lot of uh, communities have their own public health department. They do many things, among which is something like mosquito control. In the summer, public health department might go out and fog a community for mosquitoes. That's a public good, isn't it? Because it's very difficult to prevent somebody who's not funding that service from benefiting. If we fog for mosquitoes, we either do a good job of that and then we minimize mosquitoes for the whole community or a terrible job and the mosquitoes stick around. So hard to exclude non-payers and then definitely non-rival because even if there were more people in the community, they would still get the full benefits of mosquito control law and order at the local level. We have several tiers of the legal system in the United States. We have local police, local court system. We have state level police and courts. Then we have the federal government. The federal government has its own police forces, the FBI, federal marshals, and then a federal court system as well. So we have kind of an overlapping, interlocking, uh, multi-tiered system of law and order, courts, police, etc. And again, if they do a good job, everybody in the community ostensibly benefits from having that level of safety, security, the functioning of markets through the enforcement of contracts, and so on. And then finally, transportation infrastructure at a local level. So states fund roads and bridges and ports in the same manner that the national government does. So this is not meant to be an exhaustive list of public goods, but these are uh, things that most economists would recognize as full-scale public goods and pretty non-controversial that the government is involved with the production of these goods and services. Okay, now let's talk about some public goods problems. We know what public goods are. We know that the rationale of government is to provide those goods. There are some special problems that arise with public goods. We'll start with this issue called free riding. People can enjoy the benefits of public goods without paying the costs. That's called free riding. And that actually is a technical term in economics. It's not just um, slang. They free ride on others' purchase of the good or others' contribution to the good. Here's some people free riding on the back of a truck or free riding on the top of a train. My guess is that this railroad is not doing a good job of enforcing its ticket holder policy. So if you don't enforce excludability, and, and in the case of a train, you could, right? You could have conductors on there asking to see people's tickets and kicking them off if they don't. But here they're choosing not to for whatever reason. And so you have a non-excludability issue and you've got people free riding literally here in a very dangerous manner. But in terms of providing public goods, we're talking about people using the good that others paid for without making their own personal contribution. If you have significant free riding happening, people have incentives to not purchase the good or contribute to the good on their own. On the flip side of free riding is this issue of forced riding. Forced riding isn't talked about as much, but it's worth thinking about. Some people don't want a public good. They don't, it's not a good in their mind. Okay, so there's some aspects of, for instance, national defense 
that some people say, well, that's not really contributing to defense. That's maybe making things worse. And I don't want to get too much into these controversies, but as you can see from this picture, there were many people who were actually participating in a project that was ostensibly part of national defense, the Iraq war, which they said, no, we don't agree. This isn't national defense. This is maybe an offensive war and it's a war not worth fighting. And again, I'm not endorsing either view or the other here. I'm just putting this forward as an example of people who perceive that they're paying for a public good that they wanted no part of. Furthermore, we get into what I call kind of the market problems or allocation problems of public goods. And this is what I'm going to focus on in the forthcoming lectures. How do politicians and bureaucrats responsible for creating public goods know, well, several things, how much of the good to provide, and then with respect to things like roads and ports, where exactly should they go? How best to, to supply them? What's the best means of production, method of production? Do politicians and bureaucrats think about cost minimization? To what extent do they care about controlling costs? And all of these questions will ask, especially in comparison with if it were entrepreneurs operating in a profit and loss environment, a competitive market system. Do they think about opportunity costs? You might recall from an earlier lecture, I quoted uh, President Dwight Eisenhower, one of, the, one of the great economic minded presidents, in my opinion, who was explicit about the opportunity cost of particular government programs. He said the opportunity cost of having the government build more bombers for the Air Force was we couldn't build more schools to help educate people. And he gave many other examples with respect to military spending because that was the biggest item on the government's budget at the time. So I would suggest that that kind of thinking is pretty rare. And that's actually why I, I admire President Eisenhower so much because he was the rare politician who was explicit about the opportunity costs. A lot of politicians will have incentives to kind of ignore the opportunity costs of various government spending, government programs. Okay, and then finally, consumer value. And we'll talk a lot about this. Consumers of public goods are removed from the process. They're alienated from the process in ways that might be suboptimal as compared to consumers of private goods who can A, vote with their feet and B, leave feedback and often leave feedback in public forums about the quality and the service and the price. So we're going to have a detachment of information and feedback and incentives with respect to the provision of public goods that makes them systemically different from the provision of private goods and possibly in a quite inefficient manner. Now, back to our model of the market economy, the private market economy for a moment. How do entrepreneurs know all those things? Where to place the goods? You know, where should they build a grocery store versus a fast food restaurant versus a department store? What mix of products to provide? How high a quality level should be? How do entrepreneurs know all those things? Well, they have a market system that gives them information, feedback, and incentives. Okay. Remember, success in business is proof of services rendered to the consumer, says one of my favorite economists, Ludwig von Mises. So businesses will only succeed to the extent that they can meet consumer needs, provide them value, and do a good job. Businesses who don't do that will fail. So we have a dynamic feedback mechanism in the market, profit and loss, that says if you do good by the consumer, you will be rewarded. And if you fail by the consumer, you will be punished. That mechanism is not there, at least not nearly to the same extent in the political system with public goods as it is in the market system with private goods. So we're going to have some problems with providing public goods in an efficient and optimal manner. And then we can compare here what, what kind of feedback exists for entrepreneurs and businesses who do a bad job providing their products versus what happens to politicians who do a bad job providing public goods. There is feedback in government and politics, but it's at best, it's attenuated. It's not as immediate. It's not as sharp. It's not as punitive as the feedback for entrepreneurs in a market process. The ultimate negative feedback for entrepreneurs is business losses, business failure. That's much rarer for agents in the government. So this brings us to the realm of what we call public choice economics. And what we're going to do for the next few lectures is explore these differences in greater detail between the decision mechanisms for private goods, the market sphere, versus those for public goods. So stay tuned and we'll dig in more to these differences and work through some formal frameworks for thinking about them. See you soon.